Thank you, Tom. Um, a very good afternoon. I don't have a power presentation uh, because on many occasions uh, I have seen that the power presentations have uh, lots of power, but no point. <laughs> and then sometimes they have uh, points all right, but no power behind that. So I have avoided it, even though some of my younger colleagues insisted that I should have a PowerPoint presentation. First of all, uh, thanks to Irish Aid and also to uh, IAEA for inviting me to this uh, forum. It is an honor and privilege to share my thoughts with all of you. Some of you I know from earlier days, and all of you are very much involved in what we call the development business. <coughs> In my presentation, I'll just make four points. Because the theme of the presentation is human development and post-2015 development agenda. Point number one is, what is human development? The second point would be how human development paradigm is related to the Millennium Development Goals or the MDGs. And the third one, how the notion of human development is critical and should provide the substantive background to the post-2015 development agenda as well as the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. And my final and the fourth point would be a kind of a commercial. I would like to talk a little bit about this year's Human Development Report, because the theme of it, I think, would be very much relevant and interesting to all of you in Ireland. Back in 1990, we started with a very simple concept of human development. We defined human development as a process of enlarging human choices. And when we talk about human choices, there are two sides of the equation. On the left-hand side, you have the human capabilities. In order to enhance the choices, you have to enlarge the capabilities of people. On the right-hand side of the equation, you have the opportunities. Because once you enhance your capabilities, you also need improved opportunities to use those capabilities. A very simple notion, but with far-reaching implications. Let me just make three points on that. Point number one, income is a, an important part of human development. Income is a necessary condition for human development, but is not a sufficient condition. That is because income is a means to human development, but is not the end of human development. Point number two, human development is much more holistic than the other approaches that were at practice in 1990s. It is different from human resource development because when we talk about human resource development, we basically talk about human capital and how that human capital can contribute to production process. We do not talk about the kind of human beings as the beneficiaries of development. Human development is larger than basic needs approach, which was in vogue in the 1980s and 1990s, because the basic needs talks about a minimum baskets to fulfill the minimum requirements of human beings. But it does not talk about the choices that the human beings need in order to enrich their lives. And third, human development paradigm is larger and broader than their human welfare approach. Because in the human welfare approach, the human beings are at the receiving end, but they are not the ones who make the kind of the decisions that affect their lives. So in the ultimate analysis, Human development is development of the people, 
development for the people and development by the people. My last point about the paradigm is this well-known index, the Human Development <coughs> Index, or the HDI. And it is one of the first composite indices that came in 1990 as a kind of an alternative way of looking at the progress of human beings. The GDP per capita has dominated the scene for too long. The HDI is as complex as the GDI, or, but it is not as blind to the broader aspects of development as the, G, as the GDP per capita. Or in other words, the Human Development Index is as criticizable as GDP per capita, but not as blind to the broader aspects of human beings or human progress as GDP per capita. So with that particular concept, we have produced 25 reports. This year is the 25th anniversary of the emergence of the human development concept. We have produced reports ranging from economic growth to climate change, from gender equality to culture, from water to the MDGs, and so on and so forth. Now, let me come back to my second question. How this particular um, paradigm provided the kind of the substantive anchorage to what we call the MDGs or the Millennium Development Goals? If we look at human development and the way I have described it, the other side of it is human deprivation. Because when you have limited choices, when you have no choices, or when you have very low capabilities and very low opportunities, you have human deprivations. Or in other words, we can call it as kind of a um, human poverty. Now, if you look at the MDGs, whether it is MDG 1, MDG 2, and you go down the line, you see that all those development goals are basically to overcome the basic aspects of human poverty, whether it is extreme poverty, whether it is child mortality, whether it is maternal mortality, whether it is hunger. Those are basically goals for overcoming the human poverty, or what we can call multidimensional poverty. So in a way, the human development paradigm and the human rights paradigm provided the kind of the substantive bedrock on which the MDGs, as well as the Millennium Declaration, were framed on. Now, when we come to the third question, how important is human development and how critical it is for the post-2015 development agenda and the SDGs? My first point would be that you cannot have a development goal or target or indicator unless it is anchored into a kind of an analytical and substantive framework. So therefore, the post-2015 development agenda, as well as the sustainable development goals, need a kind of a substantive bedrock on which you can develop the goals, the targets, and the indicators. Now, we all know that when we ask that question, what is the substantive anchorage for the SDGs or post-2015 development agenda? the obvious answer would be sustainable development. The notion of sustainable development is the kind of the substantive anchorage on which the SDGs and post-2015 development agenda are based on. In that context, I think there are three misconceptions. The first one is, to the minds of many people, Sustainable development is about 
environment only. This is not true. We know that the sustainable development has a broader framework where, of course, environmental sustainability is important, but so is social sustainability, so is political sustainability. When we look at the Middle East and the Arab states right now, two years ago, what happened in Egypt and in other places, we know the, that the notion of political and social sustainability are important. Therefore, sustainable development is broader than environment. And that is precisely why in the Rio Declaration, it has been said that the sustainable development has economic, social, and political dimension. My own view is that it is important and it is useful to talk about the three pillars of sustainability. But do not take a pillarized approach to sustainable development. One has to find a kind of the entry point where you can bring those three issues together. But if you talk about I'll, a certain environmental sustainability and then economic sustainability and then social sustainability, that kind of a pillarized approach will not take us anywhere. To make my point very concrete, suppose you take inequality as your entry point. Once you take inequality as your entry point for the development challenges that you face, the first thing you can talk about economic inequality in terms of inequality in opportunities, inequality in terms of outcomes. So the economic part of the sustainability, you can really look at it, analyze it, and address it through the issue of inequality. Then you can also talk about the inequality of the ownership of natural resources, how the natural resources are owned by different groups, and how there is a kind of a disparity among different groups in terms of the ownership as well as the management of natural resources. There you can bring the whole question of the environmental sustainability. Third, you can talk about the management of the resources of a particular country from the point of view of the disparities and how it is playing up with other types of inequalities. And you can bring it the whole question of political inequality. Because a lot of the disruptions and a lot of the conflicts down the road have had their roots into the kind of the disparities and inequalities in terms of opportunities, in terms of resource allocation, in terms of ownership of natural resources. So therefore, my plea would be not to take a pillarized approach or a mechanical approach to the broader aspects of sustainable development, but to find the kind of the entry points where you can bring together the different aspects of sustainability to address them, to have the policy implications, and so on. The second misconception is and you can hear it from different people, <laughs> that we are talking about the SDGs because we want to focus on middle-income countries. And the MDGs were for the poor countries. And since we have spent 15 years about talking about the poverty and the MDGs for the poor countries, the time has come for talk about sustainable development because we have to focus on the middle-income countries. We all know that the majority of the extreme poor people live in middle-income countries. 500 million people out of 1.3 billion basically live in India and China, which are middle-income countries. So therefore, when you talk about extreme poverty, this is not an issue or a problem only for poor countries. It is as much as a problem in middle-income countries. Number two, if you go beyond absolute poverty and you talk about relative poverty, which is basically inequality. Inequality is rising both in India and in China. The disparities between the coastal zones of China and its hinterland is mind-boggling. The disparities between Bangalore in India and the rest of India, like Bihar or Jharkhand, is really serious. Therefore, whether you talk about absolute poverty 
or relative poverty, these are not problems of poor countries only. These are problems of middle-income countries. So the, when you talk about the SDGs being only for the middle-income countries, that is not true. When you talk about MDGs only for poor countries, that is not true. MDGs are as relevant for middle-income countries as in poor countries. And SDGs are also relevant for poor countries because we all, all know that the climate change, the environmental degradation are affecting the agriculture, the livelihood of millions and billions of people in poor countries. So therefore, <laughs> when we bring about those issues, the whole issue of poverty, they are relevant for the uh, poor countries. The third and the important question is um, whether there is a tension between sustainable development and human development. And that is something which is discussed in the, uh, in the academia, in research institutions, and so on and so forth. Um, if you come from an environmental uh, camp, you always say, well, environmental sustainability is about the coping capacity of the planet. If you come from an economic, uh, economist's front or the development front, you say, well, those environmentalists only talk about environment. They don't know anything about development. In my mind, the human development paradigms provides a broader framework to talk about both human development and sustainable development. Because when you talk about enlarging the choices of people, you are not only talking about the present generation. You are also talking about the choices of future generations. So you are focusing on intergenerational choices in terms of providing um, intergenerational capabilities and also retaining opportunities for the future generation without creating it. Whether it is in the economic field, whether it is in the social field, whether it is in the environmental arena, the whole question of intergenerational choices is very much within the human development paradigm. So in my own thinking, the sustainable development is one aspect of human development when you are talking about intergenerational choices, capabilities, and opportunities. And there is no um, tension between them as often perceived by many. One of the basic tenet of human development is universalism. When we talk about choices, we talk about choices enlarging in every society for every individual. When you talk about capabilities, we talk about enhancing capabilities for everyone. When we talk about opportunities, we talk about opportunities for everyone. So the universalism is very much at the center of either of human development as well as the index. In the index, we talk about enhancing life expectancy. That is valued in every society. We talk about enhancing knowledge. That is also valuable in every society. Decent standard of living is something every society, every individual wants to enhance there. So in universalism, in terms of the present generation and future generation, is at the very center of the human development paradigm. That said, I think there are three issues we have to be mindful of as we move forward with the post-2015 development agenda. The first issue is that when I talk to different governments, different countries, different people, particularly in the poor countries, they often say that, look, there is still an unfinished MDG agenda. So the SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goal cannot start from the scratch. It has to build on the MDGs, the experiences of it, the pitfalls of it, the failures of it, but at the very core of those sustainable development agenda, the notion of extreme poverty, inequality, and the unfinished business of the MDGs have to be there. 
You cannot just wake up on the 1st January of 2016 and say, well, that was past chapter, that was history, I'll straight afresh. That's not going to work. There are at least 20 to 30 countries which have their five-year plans where MDGs are the long-term objectives. And some of those plans will finish in 2017, some of them 2020, some of them 2019. They are not going to scrap their plan as of 1st January 2016 and then start afresh. So the unfinished agenda of the MDGs are still very much there. Second, when I look at our own experiences with the MDGs, um, we see that even though the MDGs were adopted in 2015, uh, sorry, 20, 2000, it took five years to basically integrate them into the national development strategies. It took us another five years uh, till 2010 when we really became serious about it. We talk about MDG acceleration, we talk about MDG action plan. But with the SDGs, there is no time or patience on the part of the people around the world to wait for that long to implement whatever goals we come about. So there will be a demand and there will be pressure for the implementation of SDGs as early as possible. And that is a responsibility the international community will have to live up to. The third and the final point uh, with the SDGs is that when I look at the Millennium Declaration and MDGs, particularly since I have been involved there, the MDGs were basically formulated by a group of experts. But we know that with regard to the SDGs, there have been millions of peoples, there have been thousands of consultations in different parts of the world, through the website, using the virtual uh, technology. So therefore, people would like to see the reflection of their thoughts in the post-2015 development agenda, as well as their ideas as to how to implement it. So we are talking about a much broader stakeholder in terms of the formulation of those goals, as well as the targets. And that needs to be kept in mind. My final thing is about, as I said, a kind of a commercial for the 2015 um, Human Development Report, and I'll just take a few minutes for that. The 2015 Human Development Report, the theme of which is rethinking work for human development. And let me make just five points there. One, we are not talking about jobs and employment only. If we talked about jobs and employment, that would be more like ILO. Uh, we are talking about work. So therefore, the notion of voluntary work, the notion of care work that people do within families and within communities are very much part of it. And the care work is important because there is a gender dimension to it. The creative work, the literature, the paintings from which people get satisfaction, which are very much important for enhancing their capabilities, are part of that definition. So we are looking at work from a broader perspective, and it is not limited only to jobs and employment. The second point is, we think that intrinsically work is human development enhancing because it provides you with a livelihood to earn a decent standard of living. It gives you security. It gives you a platform for interaction with other fellow human workers and that kind of thing. Yes, there's a positive linkage. But there is also a negative linkage. There are certain types of work which erodes human development. The exploitative work, the child labor, the work of the migrants in different parts of the world, domestic work under certain circumstances can really erode human, human development, destroy human dignity, and violates human rights. 
the work under very dangerous conditions, the work in, in different kind of um, mining or other places where the worker safeties are not maintained can be really detrimental to human development. So it is important to look at both the positive and negative linkages of work uh, in that particular context. The third point, women's work are important. The gender equality is a critical dimension of human development. So we don't want to take a band-aid approach or a after the, after the day approach to the issue of women's work, and which is changing quite fast. And part of it is, as we call it, like the, a tale of two cities, it is a tale of two worlds of work for women. The work outside home, the work inside home. The question is how to balance those kind of things. And the question of grass, glass ceiling uh, we are, want to bring in. Uh, I remember that uh, Mrs. Clinton has um, announced her candidacy, I think, yesterday. Uh, I think in her concession speech in 2008, when she lost it to uh, President Obama, she said, well, we have, could not break the glass ceiling, but there have been enough cracks because I have got 18 million votes from the Democrats, so there have been cracks. So therefore, I think the issue of the glass ceiling and the cracks have to be part of the discussion for the future generations. The fourth point is the whole issue of what I call the new world of work. The world of work that I knew, my parents knew, are no longer there. There's a flexible work time. There is a crowd working. You don't need a traditional office to do the kind of the work. Um, there are different kinds of services that you can have. And it is changing very fast using A, the internet technology, the mobile devices, and B, the whole issue of globalization. And please don't think that this is very much limited to the developed world or certain sectors. It is not. Coming from Bangladesh, I know how the mobile devices and the Grameen phone have changed the <laughs> women's empowerment, their economic activities in that particular country. How the use of uh, electronic transfer of money through M-Pesa in Kenya has changed these things. So this new world of work as we see it in the developed world, is moving very fast. But the mobile devices and the different kind of technology are also changing the old world of work that we know. And we still do not know what are the impacts of those things. So we're trying to look at the implications on human development of this new world of work. Yes, they have, there are positive ones, but there are also <laughs> negative ones. The whole notion of leisure has changed. You take vacations, you go to a beach, on your left side is your mobile phone, on your right side is your iPad, so that your office follows you everywhere. The whole notion of family time has changed. The whole notion of privacy is now different. So therefore, the negative impacts of some of those things on human development needs to be looked at. Our final chapter would be on the whole question of what I call sustainable work. And there, I'm not, we are not looking at only green jobs or low carbon emission jobs. Sustainable jobs are also the kind of the work that the younger generation can have. Sustainable jobs are also the kind of the work that you generate in sectors where poor people live, where the work is something to which people can connect to in terms of their creativity, in terms of their longer term commitment, in terms of uh, having a decent standard of living. This is something that we are trying to develop. As in any other um, human development report, there will be strong policy chapters and 
This is my five minute commercial on the Human Development Report 2015. In conclusion, the post-2015 development agenda is a historic moment because it provides us on the basis of our experiences to have a kind of a universal global commitment to the development agenda and the development priorities that we set. And we all know that the choices that we make today would determine the kind of the world that we shall have tomorrow. Because in the <laughs> ultimate analysis, human destiny is a choice and not a chance. Thank you.